Um, my name is Joanne Hughes from the School of Education at Queen's and um, I would just like to thank you all for, for coming to this School of Education ARC sponsored seminar on school starting age. Um, this is clearly an important seminar. Here in Northern Ireland our children start school earlier than most, if not all, other regions in the world. And it's an issue that's actually very close to my own heart because I have a child who has a June birthday, he's now 13. Um, and uh, he started school just three months after his fourth birthday. Um, today's event couldn't be more timely, uh, given the release of the Cambridge study in England on Friday. I'd like to pretend we timed it that way, but we didn't. Um, and uh, just in relation to our situation here, um, our politicians and policymakers are clearly preoccupied at present with another big education issue, the transfer procedure. Um, the issue of school starting age is of course not entirely unrelated given that one of the big debates around the transfer procedure is the very early age at which we test children for academic selection to grammar schools. So I'm looking forward to an interesting debate um, and I'm delighted to welcome our uh, very illustrious panel. Um, Dr Liz Fawcett is going to kick off. Um, Liz is a PR and communication consultant and she'll give a parent perspective on school starting age outlining her experience of kind of taking on the system to ensure the best outcome for her son. Um, Liz has been a big influence in, in organising this seminar and uh, drawing on her skills in media and communication. We have to thank her for the profile that it's received. Sue Palmer, our next speaker, probably needs no introduction to, to many of you. Um, she's a writer and broadcaster and consultant on the education of young children. Um, she's well known to UK teachers as a specialist in literacy um, especially the teaching of writing, but concern about children's lifestyle led her to research and publish a best-selling book called Toxic Childhood, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, on how modern life is damaging our children and what we can do about it. And then this was followed in two, 2007 by a practical handbook for parents entitled Detoxing Childhood. Um, her most recent book, 21st Century Boys, looks specifically at the effects of modern life on boys from birth to teenage years. Sue's also a popular speaker and we're very lucky actually to have her here today. Each year she addresses thousands of teachers across the UK and around the world and increasingly she's invited to address audiences of parents, health professionals and others concerned with children's well-being. She writes frequently in the national press and she's worked as consultant to the National Literacy Trust, the Basic Skills Agency, many educational publishers, the Department of Education and the BBC. We also welcome Professor Peter Timms. Peter is Director for, uh, of the Centre for Evaluation and Monitoring at the School of Education in Durham. Um, as Director of CEM, he's responsible for uh, a range of projects monitoring the progress and attitudes of pupils um, in thousands of schools across the UK and beyond, and he's published widely on these themes. Um, today, he'll, we'll hear him report on research which suggests that there is no optimum age for starting school. Our final speaker, um, Mark Langhammer. Uh, uh, Mark is, is um, Northern Ireland Director of the Education Union, ALT, and he'll offer a perspective uh, based on the issues around school starting age as defined by his members, most of whom are teachers. The presentation should last no longer than an hour in total, um, leaving plenty of times, time for, for questions from the floor. Okay, thank you. Well, um, good afternoon, and um, first I would like to thank um, Joanne and the School of Education and ARC for uh, holding this seminar. I do have to confess in um, having a little bit of a hand in, in coming up with the idea for the seminar, and it's great to see so many people here. Um, and I'd also like um, to thank you for giving me the chance to just talk very, very briefly about um, my own experience as a parent. I am um, one of what I think is quite a rare breed in Northern Ireland of parents who have managed to bu uh, actually buck the system, as it were, and um, ensure that my son didn't have to start at what would have been four and a quarter. But I have to say that it's an issue that really never crossed my radar. It never occurred to me until I got to the point where it was a, a personal issue that there was anything remotely wrong about starting school at the age of four or five. 
Then I got to the point where my son was three and a half, he was going to turn four and a quarter in, be four and a quarter in September, so it was sort of January time, time to go looking at schools. And he was in a nursery where he was extremely happy, um, and I looked around these schools, looked at the very sort of formal, structured environment, quite a contrast really to the playful, free-range environment he had in his nursery. And I just thought, I really don't think I can do this. Then I started looking at whether, in fact, it was possible to buck the system in any way. I um, talked to parents who had been to schools and been to education boards, um, asking if their children could possibly be held back for a year. And they'd always been told quite flatly no. I heard, indeed, of cases where even children with autism or Asperger's syndrome were told, no, you have to start at the required age. Um, so I then started to think, could I possibly say that I was home educating him? I talked to a few people in the home education field and that's when I came up with a solution for me, but it wouldn't work for many parents. Um, and that is basically, I didn't enrol my son in a school. And unless the law has changed in the last couple of years, if you don't enrol your child in a school, then you uh, are under no legal obligation to actually tell the authorities what you were doing with them instead. What I did do was I kept him on in his private nursery where he was very happy and um, nobody came knocking on my door. Um, I then managed to find a school with a little bit of difficulty which was prepared to take him into P1 and he just entered at five and a quarter and um, everything went on as normal. So that's how I did it. But why that wouldn't work for many parents is quite simply I didn't get a free place for my son during that year. I had to pay for his nursery education. And at the moment, there is no option for parents here to hold their children back a year and get a preschool place free of charge for another year. Um, so essentially, uh, there is very, very little flexibility. Um, but the important issue really is for today's um, discussion, why did I do it? Well, there are three reasons. First of all, um, there was a practical uh, issue, which is that my son was still taking a nap. He's one of those children who just needs an awful lot of sleep. And some kids do continue to take a nap if they're permitted until they're five and really need it. He didn't drop his nap until, at the end until he was four and three quarters. So a nursery environment was much better suited from that point of view. Um, but the real, you know, it, it, even leaving aside that practical issue, the real point from my, um, pra the, the important point from my point of view mm -hmm. was that the nursery environment he was in um, was both one that applied Montessori principles and also high scope, which is a very child-centered type of um, environment. The kids every day were given free option to do whatever they liked. If they wanted to spend the whole month playing with large blocks or dressing up as a fireman, they could do that. And my son really thrived in that sort of environment. They also spent a lot of time outside. On a decent day when it wasn't raining, they could be outside for most of the day. Now, you know, why, when he was enjoying that so much, he was such a boisterous little kid running around, why would I want to take him away from that, thrust him into a school where he was going to be cooped up in a classroom for most of the day, even if he got outside for part of it? And the other issue for me was that my son, again, not unusually at that sort of tender age of, of just term four, really got upset if he couldn't do something. When he was allowed to choose what he wanted to do, he picked uh, the tasks that he was perfectly capable of and challenged himself. But, you know, he wasn't under any pressure to perform. If he had gone into a school environment at four and a quarter, he would have been started on reading and writing. I could see he was nowhere near ready for it, and I just felt it was going to be horrendously stressful. So it was a happy ending in the end because he got his additional year at nursery, he loved it, he has no regrets about it now, and he was lucky enough in the end to find that we found a school that would take him in P1. But it's not an option at the moment available to most parents in Northern Ireland. And while I would personally be in favour of a school starting age as late as six or seven, I certainly do feel that other parents in Northern Ireland and other children should have the option that we had which is to at least delay for a year, if you wish. Thank you.
thank you very much again uh, for having this debate and in, for inviting me. It was very timely for me because uh, I'd started thinking about it in the middle of last week, what was I going to say? And on Thursday, the Cambridge Review was published and suddenly the media were all on the phone and I got it all worked out because of thinking about here. Um, we've had two uh, big announcements in, the, the, in England um, in the last week. First, the Cambridge Review, which recommended a school starting age of six, and this morning, government's review of um, the Rose Report, um, which recommends that we start at four, bringing us in line with Northern Ireland. So I think we're, we're all revved up for a wonderful confrontation between the sort of educational um, side of the world and, and the politicians, which is going to be, I'm sure, extremely interesting. Um, I've got three reasons that I'm very, very much um, in favour of a later starting age. Um, one of them is from my former career, really, as a literacy specialist. I mean, I've been involved in literacy, writing about it, speaking about it, and, and, and advising on it for, God, 25 years now. Uh, so that's, um, that's very deep in my bones. Um, so I, I want to look at it from the point of view of, of children's literacy, which is one of the things that I think parents, governments, societies do worry about most. Um, the second is to do with um, my, my most recent interest, which has been children's well-being, because with starting the book children, uh, Toxic Childhood um, in the early years of this, this millennium, um, I had my attention very seriously drawn to children's levels of mental health, emotional and behavioural difficulties, which seemed to, to be increasing. And um, just as my book came out, we also got the UNICEF report, which showed that the, the levels of well-being for children in the UK were actually the worst in the developed world, out of 21 countries surveyed, we came 21st. So my first issue is literacy, the second is well-being, and the third is probably just a, a sort of personal conviction about equality. Um, it's to do with the long-term social implications of what happens to children when they're very young. So the three bits, and I'll start with literacy, because that's where I feel most secure. Um, as I say, I have been consumed with the importance of literacy for a very long time and like Liz it had never occurred to me that what happened before children started to read and write which I thought you could start as soon as they're ready let's get them going uh, could possibly have any bearing on it um, until in the early years of this century um, we'd been working on literacy in England particularly with the National Literacy Strategy incredibly hard for four years and we didn't seem to be seeing any significant improvements. Um, test results went up, but I, I'm not personally that convinced that test results have a great deal to do with how literate children are. They, it was becoming increasingly clear to me that it was to do with how well children had been trained to pass tests. When governments are possessed by targets and tests, that's what attention turns to. Um, and it still wasn't making any difference in international comparisons. Um, the country that always did the best was Finland. So I thought, right, I'll go to Finland and see what they do there. And that was where I had my road to Damascus experience. Um, just spending days in a Finnish kindergarten was absolutely fascinating because they recognize, as is only sensible, that literacy depends upon a number of other things, notably children's language development, um, as one wonderful Yorkshire teacher once said to me, you know, love, they can't write till they can talk, and they can't talk till they can listen, and they can't bloody listen. Um, and language in itself is, is based in the capacity to, to listen and attend. So that's one thing that they're particularly concerned about. And the second, their physical development, because how can children sit down in a classroom, keep quiet, listen to the teacher, track their eyes on a longer row of print, and particularly manipulate a pencil across a page, unless they have developed coordination and control, the, the, the vestibular system to be able to sit, balance, body awareness in space, and so on. So the things that they were doing in Finland were a great deal of, of play, coming from the children's own interest, particularly outdoor play. They were in and out all day long. Um, and some of the, the control was to do with being able to slip in and out these little salopeds at an incredible speed, you know, so that they could rush out and play when they wanted to. Um, 
they were developing their um, singing, a great deal of music, singing and moving to music. I said to the, the kindergarten teacher, you do so much music, it's threaded throughout your day, why? And she, she said, well, music trained the mind to pattern and the ear to sound. Yep. <laughs> um, it was a socializing force, but it was also to do with patterning and with auditory memory and children's capacity to, to tune in and listen and discriminate. Um, they were doing a great deal of art and drama um, and particularly storytelling and listening activities when children just sat around, listened to stories and then picked them up themselves in their own play. So much of it was to do with it going in through their ears rather than our continual fascination in this country with them looking at things on screens. Um, so I was desperately impressed by what they, they were doing in the, the classroom and I could see that this was developing attention skills, the capacity to focus concentration, um, language obviously, and listening and, and physical development. All the things which would lay very solid foundations for children's later learning. And also their social skills because a lot of it was to do with getting along with the other children and learning just to be part of a large community. Um, one thing I did notice was they didn't hold children back. And this seems to be one of the big arguments that I get from parents. My child was ready to read when he was three and I wouldn't want him help. No, nobody there would hold a child back. Their attitude would have been, it's as damaging to a child to hold them back as it is to force them to do something that they are not yet ready to do. The difference is that you support children on the individual basis rather than the idea of a formal start to reading and writing that every child is expected to do. Looking at that ever since and at what we do in the UK, it seems to me very clear that there are two sets of children who particularly are damaged in terms of literacy from an early start. First, those from a disadvantaged background where maybe they've not had the same sort of linguistic richness at home. Maybe nowadays, particularly, they've led a very sedentary screen-based existence in their early years, so not an enormous amount of, of opportunity for physical development and so on. And the other group were boys, because boys are developmentally behind girls from birth and also do appear to need a lot more of the big, active, outdoor movement stuff to develop that physical coordination and control. So those two groups, it seemed to me, we were particularly disadvantaging. And uh, if we were to wait until six as our starting age for formal work, it seemed to me we'd be creating a much more level playing field for all children. Um, not that you're holding some back, but that all of them, by the time they're about six or seven in Finland, um, I said to the teacher of the first year that they started formal work, so, okay, how long before this lot are literate then? And he said, oh, by Christmas, on the principle that that firm foundation meant that they were ready to learn and that the, the other ones could catch up fairly quickly with those who'd already gone in that direction. So literacy, well-being. It does seem to me that if we have found ourselves as a nation with the, the least good levels of childhood well-being. We really should be looking at why this is. And for this, um, I'm particularly impressed by another Scandinavian country, Denmark. Um, I, was, I was there a, a couple of weeks ago at visiting a forest kindergarten. Similar attitude to the Finns, but much more emphasis there on the social and emotional development of children, which they see as quite rightly, I believe, from the research findings, particularly in Canada at the moment, they see as being very closely related to their own play, being, giving them time to, for, for the very natural development of social and emotional skills through play. Um, the whole principle that, you know, in your own self-chosen play, you're not under any pressure to perform from the grown-ups. You know, a kid makes a den and it falls down. That is not seen as a disaster. It's seen as an interesting learning opportunity. Why did my den fall down? Okay, next time I'll maybe put a stick to hold it up. Um, similarly, the opportunity to learn social interaction just through being with other children in play. Um, 
some wonderful work actually from an American researcher called Judith Rich Harris, which convinced me that an enormous amount of the socialization of little kids is actually done by other children, as long as they're given the opportunity to spend time with other children. That's where the older ones learn responsibility, the little ones learn various childhood law, um, and all of them learn to get along, um, how to make up after spats, you know, how to collaborate in doing things that they've chosen to do together. So the, these fairly obvious, in very important social and emotional aspects of development, um, which lead to well-being, our capacity to interact socially with others, and our personal self-confidence and resilience, meeting with triumph and disaster and treating the two imposters just the same, which come out of opportunities to play, particularly in very early life. And as the, the Danes were pointing out to me repeatedly, up to about six or seven children do not have conscious control of their thought processes and bodies in the same way that we can expect in a more mature child. So we're much better taking a more developmental approach up till then and leaving a more formal, grown-up, uh, directed approach until they're a little older. Which leads me to my third one, which is the long-term social implications of what we do to little children. And it brings me back to those two groups again. The children who, right from the beginning, seem to be doing worse in literacy and throughout school careers, children from disadvantaged backgrounds and boys. And both of these groups in the Scandinavian countries seem to suffer less than they do here. And in other countries with a, a more, you know, sort of rushed approach to, to education. Um, we have an increasing, steadily increasing gap between rich and poor. Um, and it, the poor are the ones, on the whole, who are not doing well in the educational system. We still, despite all our efforts, have fewer than half the children in the UK, it's actually slightly less in Northern Ireland than it is in the rest of the UK, who are achieving those five A to C grades at GCSE, including English and Maths, which is seen by government as the acceptable baseline requirement. Um, and the gap is widening. And more of those non-achievers are male than female. Um, so it does seem to me that we've got to start looking very seriously at whether what we're doing right at the beginning is having a knock-on effect throughout children's school careers and in terms of our social well-being. Because back there in the Scandinavian countries, there is a far less wide gap. The gap is much narrower. It is not increasing in terms of, um, of wealth and in terms of aspiration. Um, there is less teenage disaffection and uh, crime levels are far lower. Um, in fact, looking up the prison populations of Scandinavian countries, they were half those, or less than half, in some of the countries than the UK. Um, so, oh there's, yeah, there's, there's one piece of research that I'd like to cite there as well, a long-term piece of research by David Weikart at the High School Foundation done um, throughout the end of the 20th century. They looked at uh, children taught in very formal kindergartens, that would be around four to six in states, versus children who had been taught in more informal ones, two different sorts that came out much the same. The difference seemed to be a f between a formal and a less formal approach. And they followed those children for 20 odd years and looked at what happened to them when they grew up. The ones who had been, and there were children from disadvantaged families, the ones who'd been in the formal kindergarten tended to have more trouble holding down a job, more problems with personal relationships, uh, were more likely to have been involved with the police, and were less likely to vote. Um, so education's about a lot of things. I think one of them, of course we want children to be able to read and write and to do as well as they can in the system, but one of them is about helping to produce well-rounded human beings. 
Uh, in Scotland, where I live, we've got um, a, a, a four-part wish list. We want every child to be a successful learner, a confident individual, a responsible citizen, and an effective contributor. I think that's a really good way of summing it up. And I think if that's what we want, we've got to be looking at what we do from, with, with them right from the earliest stages when their brain is still very rapidly developing. Even though in both Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, we do talk about a play-based ethos in early years. Our national ethos is a come on, get on with it, we want them to read and write ethos. That comes or has come from parents, and it's also come from government. So no matter how much we might be wanting to have a play-based curriculum, very often that does not happen, and the, the drive to read and write gets started very young. I'm actually beginning to notice a slight shift in terms of parental attitudes. Certainly, I was stunned by the sorts of reactions I've done. I've got goodness knows how many radio interviews I've been doing in the last few days, both in England and then over here. Um, that the general attitude seems to be turning that people are recognizing that we're not doing the best by our young children and that they do deserve a few more years before we start pushing them to achieving grown up terms. So I suspect this is a very timely debate and that um, there is a very good chance that with the educational world moving in this direction and perhaps the swell of parental opinion, even the politicians might recognize that if we keep on doing what we've always done that hasn't worked, we'll just keep on getting what we've always got. And now's maybe the time when we'll get a change. Thank you very much indeed. Give me a moment to sort this uh, computer out. Okay, well, uh, good, well, good afternoon or good morning. I think it's just, good, just turned good afternoon now. And uh, many thanks for inviting me for the organization of this. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about research evidence that relates to what we're talking about this. But before I do that, um, in the tradition of the previous speakers, I'll just uh, give some personal recount here. Uh, I have two boys, and they're both in their 30s. My youngest son is an August-born child, and he was August-born because of cesarean section. Uh, the consultant wanted to make sure that he didn't have to work at the weekend, and so the cesarean section was on the Friday. And had it not been then, he would have actually probably been not August born, but later born. Um, he would have been too young to go to reception. And I asked him recently if he thought that it was a good idea for him to have gone. And he was absolutely adamant that it uh, would have been a, a much better idea if he'd waited a year before going to school. Having said that, I'm going to look at some, some evidence that I've got here and, and, and see where we get to. So here's the outline of what I'm going to say. First, I want to say something about the move towards evidence-based education and emphasize that. Uh, the second, a Scottish study that we did was to try to find the optimum age for starting school. We didn't find it, but I'm going to present what data we found. Say something about the international comparisons and progress that we see throughout the years of primary school and how that relates to effective teaching in different uh, parts. Then the criteria that are used for starting school in different parts of the world. Um, some, something about a study of children who are extremely preterm uh, in their birth and their identification of special needs, a recent study. Just a question and then some suggestions. Seems like quite a lot, but I'll, I'll be whipping through this, so, so don't, uh, don't worry too much. Okay, so evidence-based education, and I'm going to explain what I mean and relate that to uh, some of the stuff that uh, Sue was talking about a, a moment ago. Um, but let me point out that that's being done here in Queens and looking at Paul Connolly's work on Sesame Street evaluation um, with clustered randomized controlled trials, um, a really great piece of work showing its impact, and that's the kind of continuation of a tradition that I'm talking about. And I'm going to go back to uh, this question, is preschool intervention a good idea? And here we're talking about intervention specifically for families in um, deprived circumstances and the observation that um, the families that produce children with low attainment and low success themselves produce children in the same vein and so on across the generation. 
and the idea in such an intervention would be to break that cycle of, of deprivation and put the whole family and their children back on the road to recovery. So looking back in the 1960s in the United States, we're talking about interventions with three-year-olds and here we're talking about interventions with uh, parents, with uh, just the mother with the children, IQs less than 80, living in any city circumstances. Um, and they were putting interventions in there to try to get these children back onto the road. They weren't doomed to disaster, but it certainly didn't look good for their future. Um, and people were saying to them, you're spending money on these families. You're wasting your time. We've done that before. It hasn't worked. What are you doing this again? And the researchers were on their mettle to genuinely show that what they were doing really made a difference. And they did it by inviting people to be part of the program, and then they had more people than could be part of the program, and on the toss of a coin, they were either in the program or not. So there was no difference between those in the intervention group and in the control group, except the luck of a toss of a coin. And then those children had the intervention program, and I'll say something about what it was, and then they were tracked through over time. And the intervention they put in place of course, move these kids ahead in many, many ways immediately with that extra help. But after some time, they seem to come back together again. But following up later in life, those that had had that early intervention and were less involved with special needs, less inclined to have single parents, more inclined to have a job, and so on. So it was the random assignment to the intervention which was the basis of the evidence that was used later. So not just comparing those that had it, those that didn't, an intervention with a random assignment. The headline that came out from this work was that for every dollar spent on the early years intervention, um, seven dollars was saved later on. It was really a worthwhile intervention. What was done in those interventions? Well, the work was with parents as well as with children. So there was intensive work with those children and they use the Piagetian cognitive interventions, the type which says, what is their cognitive developmental level? Let's try to advance that. Let's take them where they are and move them forward in their thinking, in their ways of working. And I really want to ask how that compares with what we're advocating at the moment. Um, and I, it's a genuine question. And I ask it because I saw interviews with the very researchers who were running those interventions in the Perry Preschool program saying, well, what we did then is not what people do now in the high school projects. So the evidence came from something that we're not following. The interventions are good, but we've kind of extrapolated to interventions that we don't know work, that we think work. And what exactly should we be doing? So I think there are questions to follow up. And just to follow also the point made about the, um, the different interventions on the social outcomes, that work by Weinhardt was, was quoted earlier, was on a random assignment. Children in the early years were randomly assigned to an authoritarian type of approach in the early years, as opposed to a cooperative plan, do, review with the child way. And it was the authoritarian approach in the random assignment which produced the unpleasant social outcomes for the teenagers in the early 20s. So the way that we do this really matters, the way that we bring up those children. Okay, I'm going to switch now to a study that I did in Scotland a few years ago together with other researchers um, on children starting school in Scotland. I'm going to do two things. One is to look at what children know and can do when they start school in Scotland. They start school in Scotland um, uh, at the age of four and a half, but of course when you fix a date when you start, you've got children for a full age there, so full year, so the average age is five, but you've got some five and a half down to four and a half. In England, the law is that you start after your fifth birthday, but 95% send them after their fourth birthday, so they're doing it, but they don't have to do it. So there's a kind of distinction to be made there. So I'm talking here about children whose average age is about five. And then I'm going to ask, is there any evidence for an optimal age by looking at the progress that children make at school between in Scotland starting at the age of five and then looking three years later at the progress they make and asking if some children of a particular age make particularly good progress or if the young ones particularly suffer or if the old ones suffer or whatever else. So what children know and can do when they start school. I'm going to put a chart up here. And I guess you won't be able to read it from where you are, but let me just point out what I'm doing here. 
I'm looking at things that children might be able to do. For example, could you do this sum 4 plus 11 equals? Or could you do this, could you tell me what this number is? And there's the number 4 and so on. And down the left-hand side, I've got the children's scores. So this is a distribution of children. Here's the average child. Here's the, um, the most successful child. Here's the least successful child. The child is really struggling. So the child who's really struggling might be able to do something like count four objects. But they probably couldn't count seven objects. So when they're five, that's a pretty low level of achievement. That's in the bottom 1%. Right at the top end, there'll be children who can read a simple story, such as the cat went for a walk. Or they'd be able to tell you what this number is when you show them 25 or 37. So the difference between the children at the lower end and the top end is just so dramatic, so dramatic. There are children starting P1 who are ahead in their vocabulary from children leaving our primary schools and going to secondary schools. There are children starting there whose vocabulary levels are so low that they have difficulty listening to what an adult would say and getting on with that. The variation is dramatic. And that, to me, means that we must be treating those children more as individuals than sometimes actually happens. We need to take children from where they are and move them forward. In their zone of proximal development, we need to move them to, from the position they are. So to present to a young child something like a reading activity at that very lowest level would just be nonsense. But for the child who's already reading when they're five, and to deny that and move on to something else would also be nonsense. We need to accept where they are and move them on from where they are. Uh, and that means socially as well as, um, as, well as uh, cognitively. Okay, I'm then going to look at the attainment of children three years later, so from P1 to P3 in Scotland. And what I've done is to look at the progress the children have made and then look at their ages. So I'm going to put up a scattergram with their progress up the left-hand side and their age along the bottom. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to look at the ages of children to begin with. It's not the one I was expecting. So this is the age of children when they start there. And uh, the, I just wanted to make this point, that in Scotland, although we might expect all the children to be of one age, just within six months of the average, there are a whole group of children who are older than you expect in the year group. And there's actually a group of children who are younger than you expect in that year group. I guess there's one who's saying you wouldn't be able to do that in Northern Ireland, but there's a study by um, a New Zealand researcher across the world showing that even though an age group seems to contain just one age across the world, there's often seepage where pupils are kept behind or parents have got them in at a different point. Ah. That's it. Okay, so, so we're talking about children that vary a little bit, but they're more or less age. Okay, here comes back the scattergram that I was talking about, the link to age. Okay, and here's the very young children and the progress they're making. Here's the very old children and the progress they're making. And it more or less seems, it's a little dip here, that whatever age they are, the progress that they're making seems to be more or less constant. It isn't the case that the younger children are making less progress and the older children are making more progress, from the position they started from, the progress is constant whatever the age. And I'm not alone in finding that. There is a paper coming out from the United States which looked at parents who deliberately kept their children back one year in order to make them old for the year group. It's got a name. It's called redshirting. And so they looked at the data to see if there was advantage to those whose parents played the redshirting game, but they couldn't find any advantage for it. They also looked, and that, we did that for uh, vocabulary, for maths, for reading, but we also looked at the children's attitudes. So were the younger children more positive towards school? Did they like school more? Were they more positive towards reading? And a similar kind of chart there shows very little evidence or no evidence of the age being related to the attitudes once they get to point P3. So what are the policy implications? Well, there's no support for change in that uh, kind of pattern. But there are clear limitations to that kind of study. It isn't a, an intervention. We haven't tried to do something different. We haven't followed the children through later. We haven't looked at their social outcomes. 
And so it's a study worth taking notice of, but it doesn't tell us the answers. I thought I would also look at some international comparisons, and there have been many studies which have looked at children's attainment at uh, reading, maths, and so on at various ages. Um, and I'm going to take one study here, which is um, the Pearl study, which is an international study of reading levels. And I'm going to take data from 2001. It happens every sort of five years or thereabouts. Uh, and I'm going to look at the data from nine to 11 year olds. And in this chart, we've got a league table of schools, which I'm not sure you can see that. The highest in this chart is Sweden, and that's their average reading score. The next was the Netherlands, England, Bulgaria, Latvia, Canada, and so on, all the way down. And I want to make a few points about this chart, which I think are relevant to what we're talking about. One is that if you look for the low achievers, this tail end of achievers, where that's long to the left, that's England, United States, New Zealand, Scotland, Singapore, those with the very low ends, the poor achievers, despite fairly high scores, are those where English is the language and where the reading is conducted in English. If you've got dyslexic type problems, you don't want to be born in a country where English is the, is the language you have to read. It's a really difficult one to get a hold of. Almost all of the vocabulary, sorry, alphabetic based scripts turn out to be easier to read because the sound is much more tightly related to the, um, to the words on the page. The second is that down the right hand column, it tell, or second end column, it tells the years of formal schooling which the schools have had, which the, which the countries have had prior to this. If I read them down for Sweden, four, Netherlands, four, England, five, four, 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 all the way, five, five, three, four, and so on, there's no real pattern there. Of course, the data are deceiving because English children start school uh, one year earlier than the rest, and that doesn't appear in that table because they've gone by the law. But there isn't any clear pattern in there. On this particular study, Finland doesn't appear, uh, but it does appear in the PISA study, and they come top, and they go around the world talking about that, and people are really interested in what they do to get those high studies. I did uh, go to a presentation um, by a Finnish um, a presenter as to why they got such high score. Uh, the first thing that she says was, oh, well, we have the long winters uh, in which they spend their time uh, reading. Uh, and another point that she made uh, was that um, the state when a child is born, give to the family for the child a book and they're asked to get on with it. And when the children start school, more than half of them are fluent readers. So they have a different system and we need to know also that in Finnish, the sound linked to the word is much easier. So learning to read Finnish is an easier task than it is in England. Let me pick up some issues that come with that. Well, we do international studies. There's a real question as to whether like is being compared with like. So I've shared with you that chart, but I also doubt it and its meaning. Um, I really worry about whether it's giving us anything. And can you really translate a reading test so that it means the same thing from one language to another and then you put people on the same scale? Is that right to do? Well, I have my doubts about it. And we saw England in third place. That was because it collected the wrong data. Actually, in the next one down, England dropped many, many places, and this was a misrepresentation of its position. Uh, and in the Cambridge Review that we heard earlier, I make these points very clear. And also that the apparent rises or high scores for English read, um, um, reading tests are due to bad collation of the data. It's quite clear that in England, the National Literacy Strategy spent 500 million pounds and had no impact on reading whatsoever. Okay, we get no indication of progress. I think the key thing that is of interest to it is the progress the children make, not the levels they make, because they start at different levels in different countries. I want to say something about progress in school, and just a few more to go here. Now, this is work that we've collected as part of the PIPS project in Durham, so we've collected data every year on some children on vocabulary, reading, and maths. And if I look at the progress that a child would make in vocabulary from that ER at the start there, end of reception, moving up steadily through primary school. So, so children's vocabulary just grows explosively during the primary school. 
one new word every 40 minutes of their waking life they're absorbing during that period, according to Stephen Pinker. What I did was to look at the first year at school, the reception class, and I looked at the progress that the children made on average in that class. And then I looked what happened to those children later on. If they made a lot of progress in that reception, did it fade away and undetectable later on, or did it stay with them over time? And so I'm going to plot on top of that the progress made by a child who's been to a particularly effective first year at school, effective in the sense that their vocabulary increased a lot. And there you can see that green line rises and then drops back in relation to the red line um, and then stays close to it, almost to the top. So by the time we get to the top, there is actually still an advantage which we can detect as a result of that first year at school. And the same relates to the progress in relation to reading, and the same relates to the progress in, in relation to maths. And if we look at the progress in the next year and the next year, it turns out that these can be cumulative. So that if you get a really effective class and then another effective class and another, it all adds to that and it builds up over time. Of course, the reverse is also possible. And the word from the American study was that if you got three bad classes in a row, it was very difficult to recover from. But see that that's earlier progress. I'm talking about progress, not levels. Progress from where you are, from the zone where you are to the next, that progress really stays with you over time. Briefly, I want to mention this Epicure study, which I think is a, a fascinating one. This is for extremely preterm children. Children who now survive, who in years gone by probably wouldn't have survived. And this study has followed those children up through from their preterm medics, following them right through. And what they found was that if a child is of an age where they might go to school or they might not, so some might just stayed in school and some delayed it for a year, and what they found that if they'd started early because of the preterm, so, so it was early because of that, they were more likely to be identified as special needs. So that if they went to school at an early stage, they would have identified the special needs. If they stayed a year, even though they were the same developmental level, they wouldn't be identified as having special needs. In other words, the correction for age in the identification of special needs was not operating properly. Well, I think that that's quite sobering. And in our own data, come collecting ADHD type data, we also found a similar kind of thing. It's very difficult to take into account the extreme young age of some children and to take that into account when you're judging behavior patterns. It can seem like a, a maladjustment, but in fact, it's just a young child who's behaving. Alternative criteria across the world for starting school. Well, one is start after your fifth birthday. That's what you've got in England or start after your fourth birthday, or you name an age. Or the parents decide, and that's essentially what's happening in England at the moment, and they're all deciding for, almost all. They don't have to do that by law, but that's what they're doing. Encouraged by government in order to get parents out to work, I might say. That's Gordon Brown offer incentive. That's not an educational reason, but that's the economic reason behind it. Or you should start school on your fifth birthday. And that's actually what happens in New Zealand, so that um, happy birthday, go to school. And so that's happening right across New Zealand and some parts of uh, uh, Australia, some states. Or start school when you're ready. So we'll do a, a readiness assessment and when you're ready, we'll send you to school. Well, I'm not kind of coming down one side here, I'm just putting these alternatives up. And I want to put a question up. And that really is what is actually happening at that first year at school? And I think that it's happening in very different things in different places. And it was brought home to me by an epi study, this is from, the, um, from London, funded by the DCSF, where early years researchers go into uh, early years classrooms and observe what's happening. And it was recounted to me privately, but not in public, that um, one of those researchers was really amazed by the quality of what she saw going on in the reception class. It's not something that was said loudly, but I think we need to see what's actually happening in these classes, in these the first years of school. Are they the kind of caricature that we have of all sitting down at desks and learning to read, or are they something different? And the world is changing. We need to know what's actually happening there. I have a suggestion, and that is that we should look at all the evidence very carefully, but we should pay most attention to the evidence base from randomized controlled trials. We won't have it for everything, and there's a particularly good review in this early years by Ramey and Ramey. I would take Campbell's advice in this earlier, 
years that if we look for reforms, we should try the reforms as experiments to take the politicians off the hook, which says, I've done this, it's going to work, and I'm going to stand by it. Rather, I'm going to move forward and try this out, and I want to learn from it so that we will adjust in the result of our things. So, no easy solutions. But thanks for listening. Um, Mark Langhammer is my name from the Association of Teachers and Lecturers and firstly I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak, um, perhaps from a trade union perspective, on an issue which has been of considerable interest to our members. The, um, the origins of compulsory schooling were initially enshrined in legislation within the 1870 uh, English Education Act. In Northern Ireland we're a wee bit more recent in at our compulsory starting age at four years and two months, hailed from the 1989 education order. Northern Ireland has the earliest statutory school starting age in Western Europe, and uh, England's at five, and I suspect it's no coincidence that the early educational start within the UK generally um, coincides with the fact that the UK also has the longest working hours in the U EU, the fewest holidays in the EU and perhaps one of the lowest productivity levels in the EU. Um, so beyond us in the Republic of Ireland they started at six. In Finland which has been mentioned and which regularly tops the PISA assessment charts it's seven uh, as it also is in Denmark, in Sweden, Estonia, Poland and Latvia and in most of these Scandinavian countries um, the later school starting age is accompanied by fairly generous systems of preschool education. Um, the union that I work for, the Association of Teachers and Lecturers, isn't the biggest teachers union, um, but a very high proportion of our members consciously choose us. And we attribute this to the time, to the research effort, and to the money that we put into um, influencing educational policy on behalf of our members. Uh, in addition, of course, to, to the normal bread and butter trade union issues of pay and conditions of service. We're getting quite good at synthesising the views of our members uh, about how best to draw out the collective wisdom of our frontline troops who are the experts in all of this. And the issue of school starting age is one in which we've, we've been obliged to actively uh, canvas views. Uh, in addition to my own speaking notes, I've left at the back of the hall about 50 copies. There may not be enough for everyone, uh, but I've left um, the results of a, of, a, of a survey that we did. And that survey amongst our members attracted over 800 responses, which is quite high for the surveys that we do amongst our teachers. It also includes about 100 snap vox, vox pop type email comments. And while it's not suggesting that these comments are scientific, they are also unmistakable. And I'd recommend you to have a look at those. So, what does ATL think? Uh, I'm going to make three points. Firstly, the comparative research tends to indicate that there's no lasting benefit from early school entry in mathematics. Likewise, early intervention in teaching reading is unlikely to combat disadvantage. And many of our members would say that, that forcing early literature teaching uh, can be devel developmentally inappropriate. The revised curriculum in Northern Ireland uh, has helped a bit, and I should say that the enriched curriculum which we piloted in Belfast before that uh, did likewise. But the key factors in, in successful early reading remain access to books, supportive parents, and the elephant in the room, which is social class. In fact, if you, if you take the school improvement lobby, who have an interest in promoting what goes on in schools, the school improvement lobby will concede that around 85% of the educational differentials uh, are down to factors outside the school. Can be parental involvement, can be community culture, but, but mostly it's social class. So I do warn a little bit, schools matter, but they only matter a bit, okay? So it's this lack of conclusion in the evidence that has been enough for, for ATL to argue, at very minimum, for flexibility so that children can start school when they're ready. The second point I would make is that we have long argued that the problem is not necessarily just to do 
with the age at which a child starts school, but to do with the quality and suitability of provision. In other words, it's not just to do with the early start, it's to do with what you do when you get there. Uh, we do in Northern Ireland have some excellent early years provision outside of schools. We have play clubs, neighbourhood play clubs, preschool play groups, we have Sure Start. But typically, these efforts are voluntary, they're patchy, they're poorly funded, and they lack long term stability. Within schools themselves, we, I, I said we're not short of evidence. We had the enriched curriculum where, where the Belfast Board led the way. We now have the revised or the Northern Ireland curriculum which is bedding in and the early evidence from our teachers uh, is that it is, the, the teachers like it, it's working. We do get some complaints. Um, amongst the complaints are that the curriculum may favour girls, don't know about that. Uh, from a purely trade union perspective, uh, we are finding that older teachers, teachers in their 50s, who are now without the incentives of the premature retirement scheme. Um, are resigned to teaching right through. Now, the, the new curriculum promotes a more active learning style, group work, play work. Uh, and for people um, who are older, perhaps with less energy, perhaps with less mobility, some, some with chronic ailments such as arthritis, there are, there are difficulties about teaching that, practical difficulties. But those difficulties aside, the new curriculum does help to a degree. What we remain concerned about in schools is that the target culture or the, the accountability culture um, during the primary years is pushing down into the earliest years, uh, often forcing teachers to adopt uh, formal learning styles far too early. And this can be particularly detrimental to disadvantaged children and to the youngest summer board children. So the downward pressure from the accountability and testing system, it's difficult for, for even the most dedicated teachers in the early years to resist. Until this year we had a formal 11 plus. Uh, this has been replaced this year with at least two varieties of unregulated 11 plus, crudely speaking a Protestant one and a Catholic one. Um, we, so when kids at that age at 10 or 11 are about to embark within the next few weeks on potentially in some areas five successive Saturdays of testing. But equally as important, maybe more important, is that we have a pressure point at the end of Key Stage 1, where schools are increasingly drilling for stats. Now, I, I know this from my own experience, my own children, whenever they were at that age, uh, they were delighted because at the end of Key Stage 1, in the last year, they got the best teacher in the school. And the purpose was to get the kids through and get the, get them, get the, get the numbers up. But this is at 7 and, and 8 years old, and that has a backwash pressure into Year 1 and Year 2 in the primary schools. So we have primary one kids sitting NFER standardised tests. Uh, again, anecdotally, the, the, the target culture in terms of assessment units and levels at Key Stage 1 for the purpose of identifying pupils to be referred for specialist help isn't helping. And as a result of this, our members are telling us uh, of their own experiences with disaffected children who have considered themselves failures at four simply because they haven't been given permission to develop at their own pace, and I was interested at what Peter said about that, that difference. Thirdly, uh, there's resources. We would argue um, that children learn better when they engage with qualified early years teachers. Uh, there, is, there are limits on the amount of individual support on offer to young children. Primary schools simply aren't uh, well enough resourced um, to manage a variety of needs at that level. Our LMS funding system, which is unit based or to, to, to the layperson bums on seats based, um, dictates that early years pupils attract less than, than children who are older or in secondary level. I don't know if we've got the balance right there, I suspect not. We also aim for class size limits of, of 30 children per year, or sorry, per class. Um, however, this is not met in a significant minority of cases. So, to, to conclude, Early exposure to academic skills do not necessarily bring sustained benefit. They may even impact negatively on some children's motivation to learn. I do think we need to, we can't divorce the argument of, of early starting in school with the world of work. We do need more civilised employment practice, practices in terms of maternity care, in terms of parental leave, in terms of adoptive leave. Uh, but I'm going to finish with a comment from one of our ATL members in a recent survey. Um, she's a learning support teacher, which is one of the teachers who 
gave that specialised support to kids coming out, and she says it better than I ever could. And I'll quote, As a learning support teacher, I have major concerns with the current policies. To continue to admit children to formal school at the age of four flies in the face of experience from other countries. Children with below average abilities or from disadvantaged backgrounds or with developmental delays or difficulties are, formed in, are, form, are forced into formal education too young. They come to see themselves as failures in their first year at school, with all the potential behavioural and emotional problems that that will bring. I find that most of the children who come out of class to me for individual help are simply in need of permission to develop at a slower pace. But the damage that has been done by the pressure to learn, to read, to write, to do formal maths before their brains are mature enough is hard to reverse. Thanks for listening. Okay, um, I'm sure you'll agree we've had some very stimulating presentations and we can now open to the floor.
we, we have people running it who basically are being counters a lot of the time, and therefore children are turning to stick figures on graphs um, to be, you know, how many of them can we get through this test, and how many of them can, can you know, prop up our political reputations by moving on the lead tables. Um, and the actual well-being, uh, and indeed education of the children, has become secondary to this numerical competitive attitude. And I think actually that people are beginning to get wise to that now um, because so many parents have seen their children damaged by it. And I was fascinated about your story about your son because um, one of the people I got to interview uh, not long ago was um, the woman who did the review of the neuroscience uh, about early years. And um, this was for government policy. And they had not found any evidence one way or the other to suggest that the early starts to stay again. They, they, you know, nobody could find evidence one way or the other. Everybody's agnostic about this. But uh, she got a little bit, and I said, well, will he be starting um, at 25? She said, no. <laughs> so in the end, a lot of it is ethos and uh, wildly competitive ethos for the last decade. Yeah, John, just to come back to your, 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 your two questions right in there, um, I do think it's inequitable that, that people have to uh, pay to get alternative provision. And I think there's an irony that the, the, um, the market-based education reforms uh, under New Labour broadly called contestability. In other words, they believe that public services should be contested to be more efficient. Um, sometimes called the choice agenda. Uh, in fact, what you've described is, is that you have nothing, anything but choice. Uh, I think in other Ireland we haven't quite had the full blood marketisation of education that has been required in England. Um, we, we have specialist schools, for instance, but we don't have academies. Uh, but we have had BFI and BPP, and I think, you know, to come back to the Callaghan question, what's education for? Uh, it's possible that we've missed one wonderful opportunity in this in this uh, economic downturn because it, the, the nettle simply hasn't been grasped. If we were to produce, even if you looked at education as being a supplier for the economy, um, what are we doing in terms of, of bolstering manufacturing? What are we doing in terms of, of developing a new green deal and new, new, new energy streams? All of these things require active intervention uh, and none of them are happening. The fact is that we're preparing people for a very low-skilled economic uh, base. I mean, uh, one of the frightening statistics is that we're putting about 45% of our young people through higher education, when we actually have about between 15 and 18% of the jobs requiring graduate skills. So we need to work on the, on, on, on the quality of jobs as well as <coughs> quality of education. Otherwise, we're simply excluding you. Are we doing the appropriate thing with our child? 
um, at the age that they're at. So in some ways we can start them at four or five, but have the appropriate um, learning, play environment. He was very anxious about starting school. He, after a couple of days he came back and went, Mom, I can't do this, I can't reach it. Um, and after a while he realised it was all about play. When I asked him what he's doing, he's saying that playing, you know. So it seems to be working for him. I'm aware that there will be other, other children in the class that aren't ready for it. And I think that thing about readiness for school and readiness for the, um, you know, I don't think it matters what age they are, so I think it's the right intervention for that child. I think a lot of this is to do with public perceptions. 
and also messages that go to teachers. Um, what we're using, I can't remember whether we the target, um, sorry, <laughs> where, where targets become important. Those do push down into school. So it's this question, shall we not, let us not call it school till they're six, let's not call it formal schooling. That would accord very much with the Steiner type philosophy, which I utterly um, approve of. I've been to Steiner schools often and very much like the way they go about things. I'm personally also very impressed by Montessori approaches, which have a similar attitude and recognize a, a, a very different sort of developmental change in children once they reach that age of about six or seven. And I think we need to help parents and politicians recognize that that is an important change in children's lives. And then simply say, let's just call it school, <laughs> formal school from six or seven. And before that, let's call it a kindergarten stage. Now in Wales, they've already taken that approach by talking about a foundation phase to seven. And obviously children are going to be uh, to benefit from being with other children um, socially and emotionally and cognitively um, from being with teachers who can support and encourage their individual development. And then at seven we can start thinking of them in school, like a school of Wales, where <laughs> people are moving much more together and the, the grown-ups are taking more control. Um, I think we are in danger of agreeing too much here, so, <laughs> um, and, you know, are we doing the appropriate thing? Well, that is the question, and are you taking the children forward? And, in, in a sense, kind of, little phrases like play or not too formal do, do kind of hint that, but you don't get to the heart of it unless you see what's actually done. You know, you really need to get down nitty gritty there. So I'm going to kind of just dodge a little bit and, and, and do something different because there was a question about the curriculum and say something that I think that across Western Europe we do not do well with young children and that I think we could do well and, and that's to do with early number work and mathematics and it was brought home to me by working with a contract with the Ministry of Education in China and I had caricatures about what Chinese primary schools would be like and I went into some of them and so on and, and I was bowled over by what I saw perhaps they were picked out for me but I mean no doubt that across East, and that includes parts of India and Singapore and Thailand and China, that the mathematical development of those children are streets ahead of what we do. And it's not oppressed young children that are doing it. It's working with those children in a natural way to do with number. But as parents, we largely don't do. So you might well find a cake on the Chinese table and the youngster being asked to cut the cake to divide it up for everybody in the room. Or maybe asked to deal with some money at an early stage, or whatever else, or to count things. And when I show, for example, the early assessments that we do for five years old in England to parents in Singapore and in China, they just kind of laughed at the babyness of it for children of the same age. I think there's a whole area out there that, that we should as the West recognise and play with children on number at an early stage. I really wanted to respond to Carl Gallagher's uh, point, you know, that we've all got the revised curriculum now, so everything's hunky-dory. Well, uh, although I did say when I stood up there that, you know, it's happening the ever after my son, he got that extra year in nursery. When he started at school, it was a revised curriculum school. It was a, a school that said it was committed to the revised curriculum. Um, but we had a presentation from the principal and the P1 teacher um, a couple of months in, tell us about the revised curriculum. And one of the things that they said was, um, we looked at all the children and we decided whether or not they were right, they were ready for reading and writing. We decided that they all were. Well, do you know, my son um, was getting reading and writing homework really quickly that he couldn't do. And after a couple of months, by the time we got to half term, he was sent home with about 12 words that he was supposed to be able to do. He couldn't do them. And I still remember him sitting there on the stairs saying, I can't go into school tomorrow morning. I just don't want to. I can't do this, you know? So um, I know that there are probably many other schools out there that wouldn't have been pushing so quickly. That was the first year of the revised curriculum. Um, but I can give you another little example. Somebody I was speaking to on Friday, um, her son, about 
for and a quarter. It was just started at a school which did finally enrich and really, really play-based curriculum. Um, he was absolutely fine when he was at home, absolutely fine at his preschool, but when he got to his school, he just couldn't handle it at all. He's been lying on the floor, apparently, because he's just so traumatised. He just cannot take the more structured regime that they have at school. The teacher has already said to the mother, we think he's got Asperger's syndrome because he's never, never been a problem in any way before. The mother is totally convinced that this is not the case. She reckons he's just started school too early. So I don't think, unfortunately, that just having the curriculum um, it, it means that you can assume that no child is going to be pushed too soon, that everything is all right. And I do think that, you know, if parents really do have a sense this isn't right for my child quite yet. Even as a first step, just to have the flexibility to wait another year could make a tremendous difference. In fact, in many cases, it's simply the difference between saying we don't write any, we don't need to do any writing down. You know, and if, if we don't do any, then some people work till six. That would make a huge difference. Children are allowed to play with pencils and papers if they want, they're supported if they want, but we don't read and write until formally in class until we're six. If that became a generally accepted principle, then it would stop an awful lot of the sort of thing that you're talking about. Talking about.
there is some beginnings here of that, that we're having uh, certain uh, uh, infant mental health association within Northern Ireland, but that's only a beginning, and I think it goes as a long journey before we can get to where we can say to the children in Northern Ireland, have the right start. And I think it's so important that we do remember to start at the beginning and the, more <coughs> the parents are as important as the children to ensure that those children come and obtain to be the people we want them to be.
I mean, one of the, one of the issues that we talked about, for instance, was was the imbalance in the unitized funding. So younger, I mean, by and large, most research tells you that the more money you put in the earlier, the better. Uh, we do the exact opposite of that. So you know, uh, in order to 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 get to a situation where we can put more money into the early schooling, we we need to make savings. I would suggest that we need to do make savings in the in the administration of education. Um, so let me just leave it at that. We, we, I mean, just to sorry to come back to Carmel's point. Uh, you know, I would, I would accept what Carmel says about you know that we're not in our infancy in terms of developing uh, this early years thinking, but equally there is a strain in terms of the accountability system, and you know that's that's what we need to look at. Um, can I just agree with the lady at the back that um, we, we should be talking about childhood, not just education, and that's why I wanted to widen it to well-being um, and not just what children can achieve in school. But I think that this, this period between the ages of about three and about seven, six or seven, is on a sort of Venn diagram, the point at which we've got to look at what children need from where they're coming from in terms of their own development and where what we want them to be in terms of becoming responsible citizens and, and educated. That's where it overlaps. Where there's, and we've really got to get right the, um, the approach to children's development before we start hammering down on them with education. Um, that's why I think perhaps to simplify it, if we think of a school starting age of six, but a kindergarten phase before that, which is largely oral learning, play-based, and all the sorts of things we've been talking about this morning, that simplifies it. And the people that need it simplified the most are politicians. <laughs> because what happened as soon as Alexander pronounced on Thursday was that um, David Cameron's front bench immediately did a knee-jerk reaction no, we're more macho than Labour, and they don't listen, they don't think, they have no understanding of what people in education and indeed in children's services in general are actually talking about. So this is why I think, you know, that they need simple language to make it clear to them. Uh, so simple language. Um, I'm just going to make a, a point trying to bring all those questions which I think were all about change and how you make change and moving forward. And I actually think that making change to educational systems is extraordinarily hard. We have seen governments around the world trying to change systems and actually not change them. The idea comes from on top, it gets translated to the next level, translated to the next level, and in the classroom, it just, business is normal. And that's despite hundreds of millions of pounds of insect. If I give just one little figure to, to make clear why it's so hard, the estimate from those doing in-service work is that in order to change the way a teacher behaves in the classroom, it takes up to 40 hours of in-service work. 40 hours. So one little twilight session, one little bit on the internet, doesn't, doesn't do anything, it won't do anything. If we're talking about culture change, and we're talking about culture change in the classroom and in society. And in the, these are not easy things to do, but I actually think that our schools have got dramatically better. If I think to my own council school that I went to, compared to the schools that children go to now, they're much kinder, happier places than they were, and they're getting better. And actually, at the heart of our educational system are the teachers in the classroom. Never mind who's in charge, it's the teachers. And we need to get good teachers, we need to respect teachers, and we need to get the best people we can. We've got good ones there, we want even better ones, and that's how we Yes, well, I, I would have to support what Sue says, really. I certainly think that it would be very helpful if we had a kindergarten system up to the age of about six or seven. And the reason for that is that I do think, based on, on what I have seen, um, whatever you call the curriculum, if P1 to P3 is still seen as school, then I think teachers are going to feel under pressure to perform to those targets. So I would really, really very much like to see the Northern Ireland Executive very seriously considering the possibility of having a kindergarten stage up to six or seven. Flexibility for parents, some degree of choice as to what they would like for their children and the resources to actually make a kindergarten system work. Can I just uh, bring 